Washington's facing a massive challenge this week. You are Locked On Huskies, your daily podcast on the Washington Huskies, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back in to another edition of the Locked On Huskies podcast. I'm Roman Tomashoff. That's Lars Hansen. He's site editor with Athlon Sports is inside the Huskies. I'm the site editor with Huskies Wire. Thank you for making this your first watch or first listen of the day as we are part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Place your first $5 bet and you'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Visit FanDuel.com to get Started, Lars, we got a really fun show coming out all day every day today. We got a little basketball talk today because four star guard Cortland Muldrew picked the Huskies on Tuesday, and he's a lot of fun. We're probably gonna, you know, parlay that into a little bit of just regular season talk because we're excited about this basketball team, too. We're gonna talk about is Washington's offense a little underrated because I personally think it is, but we got to start with UW's elite defense, one of the best in the nation, and they've got a really tough challenge this week. Uh, Lars, and it starts with Caleb Johnson, who leads the Big Ten in rushing by over 100 yards. He has 104 yards more than Kyle Menungai, who's in second place. And he also leads the Big Ten in rushing touchdowns with 10, which is three more than the next closest guy. And Lars, I asked Steve Belichick about him at his press conference, and he just, I have never heard him praise somebody like that. But needless to say, this is a huge challenge for the Huskies. Yeah, although, I mean, it's kind of funny. I was looking at the PFF numbers real quick, and even though Caleb Johnson is ab- is absolutely fantastic and, you know, Steve's answer to your question was phenomenal because, like, when you watch the tape of him, yeah, basically he's like a pinball. just bounces around. It's impossible to tackle him, which is kind of why I asked Jed on Monday. I'm like, hey, like, doesn't it help kind of, like, going against Jonah and some of these tough physical backs in practice? I mean, who better to simulate Caleb Johnson than Jonah Coleman? Now, again, obviously right. probably not going to do that with the scout team and Jonah being your star, but the principle still applies where you're facing those guys day in and day out of practice. That's going to train your mind well when you go into some of these battles. But it is funny how only – what if I told you 11 yards separates Caleb Johnson's total yards rushing and Ashton Gentis' yards after contact? <laughs> I would just say that Ashton Gentry is just absolutely insane, but that's still point, your point again. So it, it, I'm not saying this isn't like the you know this isn't the number one running back in college football, but it is he's right up there amongst the top five in college football. And you know it's kind of ironic where you had you kind of got the buy during Northwestern with um, their leading running back being out, but then you, yeah. you, know, you go into North, you go into Rutgers, you have the two back system there, and you have the two backs again with Donovan Edwards and, and Caleb Mullins against Michigan. So let's. I sorry, I just I have a fun Khalil Mulling stat here where they held him under 50 yards. Like they they held him to his second lowest rushing total of the season. Uh the only team who did better was Texas, and Texas just absolutely stomped Michigan. But I'm when we talk about Caleb Johnson, it feels attainable, but it's all about rallying to the ball and tackling, which are two things Washington's been very good at. Sorry, I just want to make sure that gets in there where Washington, where you know, we we spent a lot of time talking about Donovan Edwards, and we had a couple of people in our or a couple of readers in the comments point out, like, hey, you guys aren't talking about Khalil Mullings as much, and Washington did a really good job of containing him. It was Donovan Edwards who we were a little more worried about because he was the home run hitter, and obviously he was able to make that happen. And Caleb can do that as well, but Caleb reminds me of Kyle Manungai in the sense of getting him on the ground is going to be the the tougher challenge. Yeah, again, it, it's no disrespect to the players, but it's almost like if your name isn't mentioned, there's a reason behind it. Donovan Edwards' 39-yard touchdown run was 11 yards or 11 yards less than Caleb Owens' total yards against Washington. There's a, a reason why you're going to talk about one or the other. But again, in this situation, when you look at Caleb Johnson, I mean, I looked at the Ohio State tape where, again, it was ugly tape for Iowa. But at the same point, that was only a seven-point game at halftime. Yeah. So, you know, very much the final score a little bit deceiving there, but again, you know, kind of it's more speaks to the other issues that they have on offense, which kind of reinforces your point of against Michigan, you had to kind of prepare for two quarterbacks potentially with Alex Orgy and then Jack Tuttle, two very different quarterbacks. In this situation, I don't even think you, it, whether it's Kate, it doesn't matter who's under center, you know the plan is going to be stop Caleb Johnson because if you're in third and seven, third and eight, kind of like what I said against Michigan, where we didn't see it a ton. But on those third and this third and five or more, it's harder. Even if you're a run first team and you want to try and get the run on, on third down there, it's significantly harder than it is on third and one, third and two. So one thing that I was really intrigued by is 
one thing that you and I have both noticed is that Steve Belichick loves that NASCAR package on third and long, where there are five five guys in the line of scrimmage, usually it's Deshaun Lynch or Voichanufi in that zero tech, zero down lineman look with you know a couple of edge rushers, maybe an outside linebacker lined up over there. But we didn't see that at all against Michigan, really. And I think that we're gonna see a similar approach where I I think a lot of the game plan remains very, very similar to what we saw against Michigan, especially when Alex Orgy was in the game, where it's just going to be crowd the line of scrimmage. We dare you to throw it on this, on this defense. And I'm, I'm curious to see how it works out because as, as much as I, you know, am impressed by watching Khalil Mullings and Donovan Edwards run tackling Caleb Johnson is going to be much harder. Much because again, as as Steve eloquently put, it it's not going to take one tackle, not even going to take two tackles, you know, and that's, kind of been previous Washington defenses Achilles heels is, hey, you can kind of get an arm tackle on one, but that's not going to work. We haven't really seen that from this defense this season. It's always been, you know, hey, somebody's holding on to him and two or three guys are right there, maybe a a yard or two behind to make the tackle. So it hasn't really – we haven't seen a ton. I mean, the Donovan Edwards one was more, I think, kind of just scheme, you know, just good play on Donovan. It wasn't poor tackling. I mean, again, could maybe tackling – I guess when you allow a 39-yard touchdown, tackling could always be better. But in right. that situation, it wasn't like – I think that was more a personnel. If you go back and look at that play, look at the all the personnel that were on, on the field for Washington on defense, most of that was the second year. And I'm not saying it was a that's an out there, but I'm just saying I think, you know, when you, you're mentioning, you know, I expect to see more Logan Saga Pollard. Get, get, get some of those bigger guys and just, just off the – you know, kind of stop the run. Say, look, we're going to have our edges tee off on you, maybe bring an extra pressure or two off the edge. But we're going to force you to pass, like you mentioned, because, hey, if we're going to lose, it better be on the arm of Caleb or uh, Kay McNamara. Because if yeah. Caleb Johnson runs for, you know, let's say 175 and three touchdowns, well, Steve's going to be like, well, we knew that was the game plan. Like, we knew it was, it's not, you're not going into this game if you're Washington thinking, well, we got to, you know, watch out for the pass because, you know, and no disrespect to Kay McNamara, but let's just follow spade to spade. You're not threatened by Kay McNamara, you're not threatened by right. Iowa's passing game. You are absolutely scared to death if you can't contain Caleb Johnson. And that, you know, similar kind of what we've seen from defenses when Jonah Coleman and Cameron Davis were able to get going. It's like you can see a difference where Will now has more time to throw. There's a little bit kind of a guess and check on defense versus, hey, no, we want to get you into the situations that we want advantageous for ourselves. And I think of the two, you kind of got to bet on Steve, especially after what he did against Michigan. Absolutely. And a lot of that is going to come down to some of the personnel that's going to be available too, where I'm just, I'm really curious to see what Sebastian Valdez's status is where Jed talked about him on Monday and was like, yeah, I'm expecting him to play. And then kind of at the end, he was like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty hopeful that he's going to play. So we'll see what that looks like. And then Zach Durf is the other one where uh, Jed Fish said he's going to end up being day to day. And you know, he's, he's dealing with a toe injury as as Jed said last week. So that's another one where he's like, yeah, we'll, we'll take it day by day. See how he's doing Monday to Friday has been a little bit of a battle. And Zach looked solid on Saturday. It seems like they're, they're certainly limiting his snaps. And Jed also mentioned that the bye week is going to be huge for him to just have some time to recover and get right. So that'll be really big, but I'm curious to see what that looks like. Cause we've seen Voy play really well. We've seen Deshaun Lynch play really well. Jacob Lane got a fair amount of snaps and looked awesome. Jaden Wayne was, was solid. He played a lot of interior as well. So it's nice to see, you know, a little bit more of a rotation in there as well. And one guy, Lars, that I know we're going to get into a lot later in the week who looked really solid that game as well was Alenius Davis. So there were a lot of contributors that stepped up and are really going to need to be just really strong at the point of attack against Caleb Johnson. So we'll see what that looks like. But we want to switch sides of the ball here because Washington's offense has been really, really good all season long, but it feels a little underrated. Which we'll get to right after a message from our good friends over at FanDuel. Hey, NFL fans, you can start the season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats for you live play by play and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. You'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. That's FanDuel.com. Com and I got a fun little four-leg parlay for the everydayers out there for Thursday night football, where it's a lot of anytime touchdowns. Lars and I are, are big on those when we do our our pre-game picks and our bold predictions. So little four-leg anytime, uh, three of them are anytime touchdowns plus 
Seahawks money line. I don't know. I, I feel like they got a good shot against this 49ers team, especially if Ryan Grubb leads he- heavily on Kenneth Walker, who I got with an anytime touchdown. Give me DK Metcalf, anytime touchdown. Let's let's see him, him put the fumble issues behind him. And then give me George Kittle as well. I The Seahawks linebacker group hasn't impressed me too much. And it feels like George always finds a way to get in the end zone against the Seahawks. So check those odds over on FanDuel and you won't be disappointed. Lars, Washington's offense is third in the Big Ten in total yards behind Indiana and Ohio State. This is a really, really solid group. The scoring hasn't been there. And yes, that's what matters. But it feels like from top to bottom, this offense is executed at a really high level all season long. And, you know, the play calling, there are things you can point to. But I feel like, especially Will Rogers, this this offense has been somewhat overlooked. I mean, you, you the answer is in the question because it's 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 every it's a result based business. You three right. and two, and you only have twenty. Who's offense do you think averaged more per game this season? App State or Washington? From the way you're phrasing this question, it has to be App State. So, but it, but it, it barely. But I, I, the reason why I say that is again, you would think because again, to your point, everything you're saying is true. Total yard. I think Washington has outgained their opponents in every single game this season. Every single game that includes the yeah. Rutgers and Washington State losses. So again, the two things in those games, what was the issue? Miss field goals. Well, as Jai asked Jed on Monday, hey, five or six in the red zone. He's like, Yeah, but we only got three touchdowns. Well, like, yeah, I'd rather get 42 than 21. Right. If you're getting 42 like you were the past couple of seasons, or you're 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 getting those touchdown drives versus oh, it's 35-3 versus you know 56-3. And I, I know that sounds okay. Well, who cares? It's still a you know, massive blowout. But I'm not saying sour points matter, but in games like this, where can you put a team like Iowa away? Or is it going to be a slug pass where Washington kind of put Michigan away with that last Grady Gus field goal? But as we both discussed, that game should have been in the books long before that last field goal attempt. There was 14 points at minimum on the board. And yes, you could say, well, Grady should make those kicks. Don't put Grady in that situation. Get those conversions, get the chains moving, keep the chains moving. And that's why where we look at the offense and say, Will's been great. Jonah's been great. Denzel's been great. Our offensive line has been passable. You know, it, it works. Solid, because, yeah. again, because again, the yards are there. This would be a different discussion if the yards weren't there. You're talking about what right. are better score passing total yards offense in the country. And Jed threw that out on Monday. It's like, right, where are you at in scoring? Like you can have 700 yards a game and be 0 and 12. It sure. doesn't matter if you can't find the end zone. You can be great between the 20s. But if you can't be great right inside the 20s or you can't score, it does not matter. And so the answer for Washington is, you know, this is kind of a good test for Washington because Iowa's going to always be a tough out, especially on defense. So can you get a 42-14 win? Can you get a conv- – and I'm not, that's not my score prediction, to be clear. But can you get a convincing conference win where you can say with Northwestern convincing? Sure, but that's Northwestern. Rutgers was not convincing. You lost it. Michigan was not convincing. You won it. It was convincing in a way, but not as convincing as it should have been. And I know it sounds like I'm kind of, you know, being nitpicky or harping or whatever. But again, to be fair, this isn't Steve Sarkeesian coming in 2013, you know, that the Peterson 2013 era where it's like, all right, you know, Sark, we were in that seven, eight, nine win game, you know, so you can kind of get a couple of years to build into 2016. You're coming off a national championship and 25 wins in two years. I sure. know it's not the same team. There's still a handful of players on that team that are from the past couple of years and beyond. So to me, the expectations are higher for Jed. So yeah, it might sound punitive, but also this is what you hired Jed Fish, an offensive-minded guy who put up points in Arizona to do. And the offense has been good, but I think the points left out on the field, the meat left out on the bone, as the players would say, is why Washington's offense is underrated. I I really like that answer. That's just really solid from top to bottom there because this group is 21st nationally in yards per game and tied for 17th in yards per play. So all the production is there. And that's kind of what makes this, this one of the reasons we wanted to have this conversation because you're going up against a really, really solid Iowa defense where, yeah, you know, Ohio State just did what they did to them, which shows that it is possible where Ohio State is one of the two offenses in the Big Ten that has more yards than per game than Washington. So there is an argument to be made that Washington should find that can find a way to put points on the board consistently, but they haven't. And it's just extremely frustrating when, as you said, Lars, there are so many good 
individual performances in this offense, Will Rogers, Jonah Coleman, Giles, Denzel, where you go up and down that list and you say, oh yeah, all these guys are producing together at a really, really high level. So what's the holdup? And yeah, you can point to the missed field goals. You can point to the play calling. You can point to all these different things. And all it is, it's is something that we talked a little bit about with, with Jake Butt the other day, is it all makes the fact that they're four and two even more frustrating. But at the same point, in year one of Jed, it also shows that everything is going in the right direction. And if you can figure out some of these things, because, you know, they're not necessarily massive issues, in my opinion. Because it's it's sh- it's showing that it's working. Where it's like, oh yeah, you know, they're seventy fifth in offense. Yeah, there there's some things you want to figure out. But the fact that you know, with this entirely new group, with this really inexperienced offensive line that hadn't played together at all coming into the season, you found a way to make this work. It shows that all the pieces and all the things that Jed wants to do are there, but it hasn't come together yet, which is just really frustrating to say the least. Exactly. And that's kind of the catch 22 situation. It's why, you know, when I mentioned earlier in the year, when Yogi Ross brought it to me, look at Jed's first year at Arizona. Yeah. He was one of 11, which again, was not going to ever be the case at Washington, but a lot of those games were one score games where you play here and play there. It goes maybe Jed's five and seven in his first year at Arizona. And then he's, you know, eight and four his second year. And then his third year, he's 11 and two or 11, 10 and two or whatever it is. You know, Cause Jed got better every year. And so you can see the progress. And I think, not to push back on something you said, but, you know, the one glaring problem that was kind of, you know, an overarching issue was the penalties, and that got improved against Michigan. You know, yeah. the, the the one area in which you did not beat Michigan was penalties. Like, Michigan right. had more penalties and more penalty yards than Washington, and it's like, okay, there you go. And for, what you know, whatever it took to clean it up, now, again, it's one thing to have a one-off. It's something else to be sustainable. If they can finish That's- off... Sorry, that's that's one thing I want to mention for this week in, in particular that I'm going to be keeping a really close eye on because Iowa has the least amount of penalties and the least amount of penalty yards in the country. So prove it again. That's all right. I just wanted to get that in there. No, exactly. Because I didn't know that stat, but I was, gonna, I was gonna assume, you know, Iowa being one of the more disciplined teams under a, a guy, you know, cut off the Chris Peterson tree like her parents, where you know, here's a mind blowing stat. Iowa also averaging more um, points per game than Washington this season. How about yeah, that's that? that's not great. I I, I, once I realized that, I was like, oh, I picked the wrong school to compare. I mean, shout out to State. I love that State plug. But it, it kind of just gets to everything where, and again, I don't want to sound like I'm taking shots at Jed because we both like Jed. And, and, like, and, and it's, not, it's not like, they're, like you said, they're not bad things. They're not big bad things where it's like, wow, Jed clearly can't handle this part of the field. But it's, it's almost like always been something where it's either play calling, penalties, execution what it, it, one one of the two at a time rarely have they actually all three been the case and there, there might have been once i think this season where that was the case but for the most part it's always one thing and it's like okay we all just get on the same page and michigan seems like it was that game that got everybody on the same page and it wasn't perfect that's the other right. thing it wasn't perfect it, like i said you left at least i'm gonna say at least six points nine points on the board but really Let's meet in the middle and say 15 to 17 points on the board, depending on one of those two should probably have been a touchdown. You take a field goal on the other one, call it a day. To me, it's all right there for Washington. I was very gettable. I mean, you know, again, now if, if you're down, let's say 10 to 7 or 7 to 3 at halftime to Iowa, that's fine. I was sure. Ohio State was only up 7 nothing at the half. So it's not – it's not like, a, oh, wow, you know, Ohio State blew him out. Washington can barely get by. It's like, let's not create that narrative because I know that narrative is going to come out there after this game. But all that matters is winning in the way that you want to and coming out with the victory. Like, you can't you can't come off the heels of Michigan and lose to Iowa. And I know it sounds kind of harsh, but it's, it's almost like imagine you beat Oregon, you know, you beat Oregon at home and then you lose to Stanford the next week at, at Stanford. Or you, you know, beat Georgia and lose to Vanderbilt. Something, something like, like that is. You know, that, that's a great, that's a, that's a great, that, we, we, you know you. what, take a bow for that one. Now that was Thank actually you. a perfect comparison there. Uh, but no, no, so I, I certainly understand where, where you're going with that. And one thing I want to say is why, you know, another thing that we're, makes it feel like it's going in the right direction is when you look at some of that play calling in the red zone. Now it did look a lot better. And, you know, you, you talk about getting on the same page giving Jonah Coleman a whole bunch of carries inside the five yard line. He scores two touchdowns on one drive. We don't need to go into that, but seeing those sort of things 
is really nice because it just shows, yes, Jed is trying. He is finding ways to improve and he is taking steps in the right direction, but it's something that takes time. And he listens. Yep. He certainly does listen. That is that is a very big part of that as well. And, hey, Jed, do like a media seven on seven flag football game or something. We'd have a ton of fun with that. I just want to throw that out there as well. We'll, we'll see what happens with that. And here's your segue. I know for a fact you're going to get Tony Bland involved in that. There might be a good reason to do that. I'm just going to hit the button. That was perfect. We'll get to some basketball talk right after a message from our good friends over at Game Time because Game Time has a new feature called Game Time Picks that makes getting tickets for your favorite live events even easier. Game Time Picks filters out the fluff to show you only incredible deals on great seats so you don't have to waste time searching through thousands of tickets, which is great news for any Husky fans that maybe want to attend some basketball games because there are only two football home games left this year with USC and UCLA coming to town. But good news is basketball season is getting close and there are going to be so many fantastic seats at Heckhead over on Game Time. So the Game Time Picks curation makes it easier to save so much more on sports, concerts, comedy, theater, and so much more. All in pricing, if you toggle this feature, so it's total upfront with no surprise fees at checkout. And with seat views, you can get a panoramic view from your seat in the app before you buy. You take the guesswork out of buying tickets to Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Lockdown College for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-C-O-L-L-E-G-E for $20 off download game time today what time is it game time Lars I applaud the transition by you we, we wanted to jump into a little bit of basketball talk because this was something we were we, we were tipped off on shout out to our sources a couple of days ago that sounded like Cortland Muldrew was somebody who was really feeling UW at the time we saw him on his official visit on the sideline over the weekend at the UW Michigan games so that was really cool and he picks Washington on Tuesday. He's ranked number 96 by 247 Sports and is the number 17 shooting guard. He goes to Oak Hill in Virginia, one of the, the better prep schools in the country for, for basketball. Uh, he's listed as a shooting guard. Sounds like he's going to play point guard. And Lars, looking at his skill set, I like that a lot for him. He's somebody who's been a really late riser. I've seen a couple of things saying he's one of the more underrated players in the country. And this is a guy who, you know, there are a couple of, Big time guards that are leaving this year for Washington, DJ Davis, Tyree Anacho, and Luis Courtright are all in their last year of eligibility. So getting a couple of guys in the building at the position, I know you know the the top name that everyone's going to be watching for, who's got UW in his final eight, I believe, is five star Darren Peterson. We'll, we'll see how that plays out, but this is a really nice get for UW, and especially as the season grows closer, I'm I'm getting really really excited for this basketball team. Credit to Danny Sprinkle, friend of the program. Yeah, well, I mean, like I showed you on that video, I mean, now we now we know why Danny was there at the game. I mean, not that Danny is not there at some games, but especially like you know that weekend where it's like, hey, I need to get out there early on the sideline. And I think it's an it's an important get for Washington in the sense of I saw a story on Zags blog, and I put this on my story on Athlon by I think it was like September thirtieth. It was pretty within the past couple of weeks. Washington wasn't mentioned. Now again, previously he had mentioned that, you know, Washington was a school he was looking to visit, take an official visit to, but he'd actually scheduled an official to LSU for this coming yeah. weekend. And all indications are that he's not going to take that trip. And he basically picked Washington over LSU, which, you know, say what you will, like that, whether it was, you know, LSU would say, hey, well, you know, we passed on and we didn't end up wanting him on that visit or whatever. You know, again, maybe he chose Washington first and wanted to get it out of the way. So he's choosing Washington over LSU. Like that's a legitimate claim to say. And if you're Danny Sprinkle, this shows kind of, you know, on the heels of Jace Butler where and Zoom Diallo, where those are the only two high school guys that he ended up taking this past spring. Because again, most of the roster, as you mentioned, transfers kind of laden heavy. That's what you would expect. But I think Danny likes having kind of versatile two guards, like two or three different two guards that can play the one, the two, or the three. And that's what it sounds like this could be the case of where he's comfortable playing a number of positions. And I think when you look at, you know, Washington basketball over the years, we're saying, is Corin Johnson going to bring it up? Is it going to be um, Severe Wheeler? Now it's like, well, it almost can be any number of guys where you're talking about it could be a Zoom, it could be Muldrew, it could be a number of guys that are coming up sure. over the years. And I think that's a good problem to have because when you look at the Big Ten, what do you need? Size and length, like your yeah. speed and length. Like that's well, exactly what you're getting here. So yeah, well, because he's listed at 6'3, 170. I I see him playing more so as a point guard. I, I yeah, I was watching a little bit of tape on him earlier. 
he he likes to pull up and shoot, and I I respect that. I appreciate that. But he was I was reading some of the the comments he did with a few different interviews, and he talked about moving primarily to point guard, which I'm I'm just curious to see curious to see how that works in this offense where it looks like Zoom is going to be one of the primary distributors on this year's team. And then just kind of looking ahead, you know, we know that Great Osborne is going to run the point a little bit. Uh, he's going to run the floor in transition as well. So I, I, I'm really excited to see that. But that's one of the things that I'm most curious about when it comes to, you know, something that we asked Danny on this show over the summer is what is this offense going to look like? And he said, yeah, it's going to be certainly, you know, the same in a lot of areas that it was at Utah State. But there are going to be a couple of things that need to be pretty different. And a lot of that, you know, we wanted to keep this main line of recruiting and talk a little bit about the season as well is, but that, a lot of that's going to start down low. And if you're not, where it doesn't seem like the Huskies are really in the race this year for any of the premier big men in the country, that seems like, in terms of the high school kids, that's going to be something that we're probably going to see a lot in the transfer portal. And so that's that's just something to you know lead into a question. It's my very long winded way of asking you is what do you think that strategy is going to look like? Because we're going to see great, we're going to see Frank, we're going to see Chris Conway and Casey Beckway and Wilhelm Breidenbach and all these guys get touches down low. And do you think that's going to be more of a sell to the high school kids or to maybe you know some of these mid major big men who are looking to move up for a season or two? So I, it's definitely the latter because and I, 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 agree. Applaud, I, and I applaud Danny for the, because I think it's basketball and especially coming up in the high school ranks. You know, if you want to take a football comparison, it's like, it's easier to play wide receivers and kind of cornerbacks, you know, certain skill position guys, whereas playing in the trenches, big men down in the post, you know, we've seen, you know, Jackson Grant, you know, come out of Olympia and have to, you know, take a couple of years to develop. There was always, you know, shout out to Danny Strickland, but you know, one of those guys where getting those guys out of high school, you're not, you can get the Isaiah Stewart's every now and then, but look at Jaden McDaniels, who was another forward, again, more of a stretch, stretch three than anything else, maybe a, maybe a four, but not a true post kind of guy forward. And I think in that sense, with the, you know, the growth of the transfer portal, you're looking at more as, I mean, Casey's a junior. So Casey will have one more year. Great. I believe and the other two are also true seniors slash yeah. guys at the end of their eligibility. So it's a combination of saying, hey, we'll show you maybe for a one level of transfer, here's how you can be an impact guy. And on another level of transfer, here's how you can be, you know, kind of a bench role player guy, like what I imagine KC is going to be real. So get significant minutes, but I would imagine Frank is probably more so going to be the starter at the five next to grade. That just kind of seems like a more logical pairing there, in my opinion. Danny can tell me if I'm wrong. But to me, all those messages, none of that speaks to high school. Now, maybe in year two, three, four, you know, as Danny gets down the line at Washington, sure, then he can say, hey, here's what you would expect is, you know, if you bring in a sophomore transfer next year and try and build him up for a couple of years, kind of like what he's done with great. But almost great's that same sort of sell to where if you're going to say, hey, here's a high school guy who I brought all the way from Europe, the Spain, England, all that sort of thing, develop them from Montana State, Utah State, now Washington. I can develop you over the course – but here's the track record. Look at great his first two years in Montana State. He came off the bench. He was not a starter. Yeah. He wasn't an impact. Right. Hey, I'm going to start as a freshman, 30, 35 games, and we're going to call it a day. No, Danny doesn't really play that. And so I think that's why it's going to feed more into the portal. And, I mean, basketball, the one sport where, like, yeah, plenty of portal guys to go around and plenty of resources, clearly, at Washington to make that dot work. So that – I'm I'm glad you, you used the word resources because that was the last thing that we wanted to get into with this is – you talked about, you know, Washington kind of coming on really, really late in the in you know, just Cortland's recruitment to pick him up. And I'm really excited to see what that looks like going forward, 2025, 2026. It seems like Tony Bland, who you mentioned a little earlier, Danny Sprinkle, and just this entire coaching staff has done a really good job on the recruiting trail as a whole. And just from things that I, I, I'm pretty sure both you and I have heard is they're going to be in contention for some of the nation's elite prospects moving forward. Yeah, and to be clear, the Tony Bland comp was because he had actually done something with Jed for the dunk contest over the summer, so that was the connection there, why you tie those two together. The true credit for this one actually goes to DeMarlo Slocum, the former Utah assistant, who was the one that played point and offered him along with Sprinkle back when they saw him over the summer. So Slocum is a guy that I was really high on when he came from Utah. He's a guy who banned yeah, the back 12, so he, he knows how to kind of – he's 
I think that was why Tony Land was almost the icing on top. Where again, you can say what you will about what happened in the past. So, you know, I think there was a lot of wrongdoing done there. If we can kind of look back, and you know, history is not so well to those who don't look back and at least reassess every now and then. So for Tony Land, I was kind of like, okay, he's the cherry on top, maybe the, like the California guy. But DeMarlo has been a guy who can go all over the country and up at blank camp. But I think just having multiple guys on staff is the key for Danny, where, you know, under Hopkins, it was, hey, we got Conroy for the local guys and basically everything recruiting. And like, great. Who else? What's right. we got? Like, well, Will's great. Don't get me. That's not a slight of Will. Like, but it can't just be one guy, kind of like, you know, Chris Peterson, where it's like, it can't just be Junior Adams recruiting all your offensive guys or, you know, C. Bill, you know, it's, it takes a whole collection. It takes you know, everybody on the staff, whether it's any sport, but specifically in this case, basketball. And Danny's young enough to where he can play a significant role in that, but you still want to make sure your recruit, your assistants are doing their job as recruiters. And so Slocum's got to get the credit on this one. Lars, as always, thank you so much for being here. Thank you all ever dares to tune in. We really do appreciate your support. And we really appreciate you making Lockdown Huskies your first listen today. Now for your second listen, check out the Lockdown Big Ten podcast. Craig Schumann puts the Big Ten first. When everyone else overlooks it, you can find Lockdown Big Ten down in the description below on YouTube or wherever else you listen to your podcasts. And if you like what we have to offer, make sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. So that's YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music. We're there. We're everywhere. We're updating this channel with new content every single day. So make sure you click that like button, click the little bell so you never miss when we post a new video. Any questions, comments, concerns, make sure to drop them right down below in the comment section. And if you're audio only, please leave us a five-star reviews. It does help us out a lot. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we'll talk to you on Thursday.